Well, let's get started. My name is Don Haas. I'm uh, the Director of Teacher Programming at the Paleontological Research Institution, and uh, PRI and I are your hosts for Science in the Virtual Pub, which tonight is the one-year anniversary of, and we've got a special event, uh, Women in Paleontology panel, which we're about to get started here. Um, and uh, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Phoebe Cohen, who is uh, the moderator for tonight's panel. And uh, welcome one and all. Take thanks, it. Don. Um, and thanks to all of you for uh, joining us this evening. Um, I'm Phoebe Cohen. I'm an associate professor at uh, Williams. Uh, um, in um, and uh, I worked at PRI right after college. So um, PRI uh, played a, a really big role in my career as a paleontologist. And so I'm really excited to be here um, to moderate this panel. Um, and I'm joined by an incredible group of women paleontologists. Um, and so I just wanna thank all of them for, for um, taking the time out of their very busy lives um, to join us tonight for this conversation. Um, and it is gonna be a conversation. Um, so I'm gonna be the moderator. I'm gonna let each of our panelists briefly introduce themselves and then I have some questions. Um, but I think our goal for this is really for it to be, um, you know, that you're sort of eavesdropping on a conversation between uh, the six of us. And um, uh, we'll talk about, you know, the good and the bad and um, maybe a little bit of everything in between. Okay. Um, I forgot to say my word about the uh, sort of structure oh, yeah. of the Q&A. Um, yeah, yeah. So we'll do uh, uh, a structured uh, question and answer um, where we'll ask, we'll put folks in breakout groups after the, the panel is done with the, the main part of the discussion, where you'll be in uh, breakout rooms for five or 10 minutes, depending where we are on time, to uh, peer review your questions. And um, some of those can be raised in the chat during the talk, but we'll um, probably only address those if they're sort of immediate to the discussion. And the other ones will we'll push to that structured Q&A uh, to give us uh, some uh, more carefully crafted questions during that time and to give the panelists a moment to, to breathe after they've um, finished presenting. So hopefully that makes sense. And now I'll pass it back to the panel. Thanks, Don. Um, okay, so I'm just gonna uh, ask folks to introduce themselves as they're showing up on my list. So Carly, if you wouldn't mind unmuting and just letting us know who you are. Hi there, I'm Carly Peach. And right now I am an assistant professor in the geology department at San Jose State University in San Jose, California. And this is Women in Paleo. So I'm a paleoecologist. I use the fossil record of marine invertebrates, things like clams, snails, aminoids, and corals, among other groups, to search for common patterns of extinction and recovery following ancient extreme climate events. And we're looking at specifically the end Permian mass extinction and the end Cretaceous mass extinction and submarine volcanic events in the modern. And a little bit of my I guess educational background is I'm also a Cornell and PRI um, person. So I did my undergrad at Cornell, graduated in 2009 and spent four years volunteering and interning at the Research Institute and the Museum of the Earth. And then I did my PhD at the University of Southern California with Dave Botcher and Frank Corsetti. And we were in a great cohort there of mostly women paleontologists. So it was a really fun time. Um, in grad school, and then I came back to PRI to do a postdoc before taking my faculty position. Awesome, thank you, Carly. Um, Patricia. Hi, everybody. Um, I got into paleontology because I fell in love with dinosaurs when I was seven years old, um, but then I betrayed them and became an invertebrate paleontologist. Um, I study fossil clams and snails, and particularly snails that eat clams by drilling holes into their shells. Um, my education background, I got my BA at the College of Worcester and I got my PhD at Harvard working with Stephen Jay Gould, as did a few other people in this room um, in 1979. So I am the elderly 
woman in the group. Um, I've taught at the University of Mississippi, University of North Dakota, and then I spent, have, I've spent the last half of my career at the University of North Carolina, Wilmington. Um, I also was a program director at the National Science Foundation. I love to teach, and some of the things I'm most proud of are my teaching awards. I received the Outstanding Educator Award from the Association for Women Geoscientists, and then in 2014, I was um, uh, the United States Professor of the Year for um, master's colleges and universities. So, so that was really special. And practically immediately after that, I retired um, in 2016. I'd been, I was just tired of operating on a schedule and I wanted to have time to, to travel and uh, see my kids and grandkids. And uh, I got my wish this past year when I've been living with my daughter and taking care of her two little boys um, for the last, the last uh, year. Um, so I retired after 37 years of, of teaching, but I'm still involved professionally. I still do research and I'm still on, I'm on the boards of uh, the Paleontological Society and the Association for Women Geoscientists. And I have a PRI connection too. I was the president of the board of trustees for, for a couple of years. So I'm glad to be here tonight. Thank you. All right, uh, Yorena. All right, hello everyone. Um, it's nice to see all, all colleagues and, and new ones. Uh, nice to meet you. Uh, my name is Yurena Yanes, and I'm an associate professor in the Department of Geology of the University of Cincinnati. Um, I'm an invertebrate uh, paleontologist. I study quaternary mollusks, and I use them to reconstruct paleoclimate and paleoecological conditions. And um, I'm originally uh, from the Canary Islands. Uh, which is part of Spain. So I was born and raised there and I got my degrees there. I'm actually a biologist by training. And then I did my PhD in paleontology. And uh, I did a, a number of postdocs here in the US. I work at Virginia Tech, the University of Georgia and SMU. Then I went back to Spain. And finally, I, I got a position at the University of Cincinnati in 2013. So I've been there for a while and I'm very fortunate to work there. It's a great place. And um, yeah, um, this is actually the third uh, panel that I participate on women in geosciences <laughs> this year. So uh, thank you so much for inviting me. And um, yeah, nice to see you everybody. Thank you. Lisa, you're out there somewhere. All right. Hi. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Lisa White. I'm the Director of Education and Outreach at the University of California Museum of Paleontology at UC Berkeley. Uh, prior to becoming Director of Education eight years ago, I was Professor of Geosciences at San Francisco State University. Uh, so my academic career uh, started there as a faculty member. I was there for 22 years. Oh, I should say my uh, research and training is in microfossils. So I study uh, diatoms, other siliceous microfossils, and very interested in the kinds of rocks they form, diatomites and cherts, and all the clues uh, those rocks and fossils hold for past ocean history. Uh, I've uh, done quite a number of, of things in my, um, my career uh, that are in addition to paleontology. Uh, so I have been an administrator. I was associate dean of the graduate division at San Francisco State, also uh, associate dean of the College of Science and Engineering. I've been active in a number of programs to increase diversity and inclusion in geoscience, uh, starting with a number of programs in my San Francisco State days that uh, really empowered urban youth to learn more about geosciences through outdoor experiences. And in my current position at Berkeley, it's really great to be able to focus on broader impact, science communication, educational partnerships, and who doesn't love paleontology, right? So it can be a great uh, gateway 
to earth sciences and many connected careers. And we have a rich uh, series of web resources at, at UCMP uh, that are really great ways to involve the public in a, in a whole host of things. Uh, my roots are in San Francisco. Uh, my undergraduate degree uh, is from San Francisco State. My parents actually met there in the 50s. I still live in San Francisco. I do get out. I travel a lot, or I used to anyway. Um, but my graduate degree is um, from uh, University of California at Santa Cruz. And my experience as a graduate student, where I was the lone paleontologist in a sedimentology lab, was really great for learning early on to work across disciplines, really embrace earth system science and think about all the applications of uh, microfossils in particular. So really delighted to share a panel with all these wonderful women tonight. Thank you, Lisa. And last but definitely not least, Franca. Yeah, hi everybody. Um, my name is Franca Obo Ikwenobe. Um, the student called me Obi-Wan Kenobi because he can't pronounce my last name, but that's okay. So I'm actually a transplant from Nigeria via the UK. So I was educated at the University of Ife. That name doesn't exist anymore. It's now called Obafemi Awolowo University, uh, where I got my bachelor's and master's degree in geology. That's where I was introduced to paleontology by um, Olusha Gunwadegoke. Some of you might know of him because he worked on mollusks um, as a paleontologist. So he introduced me to paleontology. But while I was there, it dawned on me that I really loved sedimentary rocks. And I wanted to be able to combine my love for sedimentary rocks with paleo. And somehow or the other, I found myself doing palynology. And then I went on to the University of Cambridge in a Commonwealth scholarship uh, where I obtained my PhD degree. And then ended up in the middle of Missouri, a place called Rolla. Um, Some people never heard of it, but it used to be the Missouri School of Mines and later University of Missouri Rolla. And then now we have another name, Missouri s &T, Missouri University of Science and Technology, where I, I actually rose through all the ranks and I'm now professor of geosciences and geological and petroleum engineering and the associate dean for academic affairs in the College of Engineering and Computing. So um, many of the ladies on this panel and some on this call, I met throughout the years by my involvement in all the professional societies. So it's, um, I'm really happy to be part of this panel. Thank you. All right, thank you, everybody. Um, oh yeah, and Don just put in the chat that um, one of the reasons why we're doing this panel when we're doing it is uh, that we are celebrating the um, opening of PRI's Daring to Dig Women in Paleontology exhibit um, that opens on Saturday. And he's put a link into the chat. Um, and many of the women in this group and uh, who are on the call um, have contributed to this exhibit in, in various ways. So just to, um, to acknowledge that. Um, I'm just gonna say a little bit about myself because I didn't, you guys all gave such good introductions. <laughs> Mine was very sparse. So yeah, I went to Cornell, then worked at PRI um, and did my graduate work at, at Harvard. And my area of research is mostly in the early evolution of, of eukaryotic life. So I study really old, tiny fossils. I'm a micro, micro fossil person, but on the other end of the time spectrum from the other micro paleontologists here. Um, and so I'm interested in kind of the early evolution of life and leading up to the, to the rise of animals, although I've also expanded into um, the stomping grounds of PRI and working on the end Devonian mass extinction as well through the microfossil record. So that's just a little bit more about me. Okay, so now we're gonna get into the questions. Um, so panelists, my idea here is that, um, you know, if you, if you feel moved to speak, please do. And I'd, I'd like this to be um, as much of a conversation as we can manage to do it in the, the you know, sort of awkwardness of Zoom. And we'll just, we'll just see how it goes. Um, okay, so the first question was, how have you seen the experience of women in our discipline change since you were a student, which is, you know, going to be a different decades for different people in the group. Um, and what changes do you think still need to happen moving forward. Should 
Do you want the old person to go first? Go for it. We love your perspective. <laughs> I've probably seen the most changes. Um, yeah, I. first of all, there are a lot more women in paleontology than there were. Um, yeah, I never had a woman geology professor. Um, I think or I was told that I was only the second woman to get a PhD at Harvard in the area of invertebrate paleontology. Um, I was the first woman faculty member in the School of Engineering at the University of Mississippi, first and only. And also when I went to North Dakota, I was the only woman in, in my entire college. Um, so there, there just were not any other women. And you'd go to a professional meeting like uh, GSA, where we all see each other every year. Well, we used to anyway, before the pandemic. Um, there, there really just weren't other women. And there especially weren't women in positions of leadership. Um, so uh, I am a past president of the Paleontological Society, and I was only the fourth woman um, to hold that position in 100 years. So that's, that's kind of alarming. Since then, I think things have improved. Um, we've had one other women, woman president since then, and our president-elect is a woman. So maybe things are improving. Um, I also think there's much less overt hostility towards women. Um, when I was a graduate student, I got my own office because I obviously wasn't going to fit into the male uh, shared office by all the, uh, the office that was shared by all the graduate students because it was covered in pornography. And uh, I don't think we would tolerate that today. Um, so things superficially have improved. Um, but that's my very long-term perspective, um, you know, 45 years or more. And it'd be interesting to hear what people would like to say who haven't been in the field so long. Yeah, I can go next. Um, I had exactly what you said as my first sentence that there are men in the discipline than when I was a student. Um, at that time, it was, I was discouraged by a lot of people, including members of my family, you know, from studying geology and paleontology because they felt it was unsafe for women to spend weeks in the field. And my, my experience as an undergrad was that my male um, field partners looked up to me. There were only three of us in our cohort who were women. They looked to me and the other three women as the intellectuals, you know, to do the intellectual work, why they did all the physical work. And I think that goes on today. They were the ones chipping away at the very few metamorphic rocks we could find in the tropics because there were very few of them. And so that was one of the experiences I, I had. But does this still happen today? Perhaps so. And we've also heard about the harassment of a lot of females in the field, and even not just in the field, by their professors and their peers, and um, during field work. So safe spaces for field work and equal access to resources and facilities are some of those issues that still need to be addressed moving forward. Um, we have this still going on today. So I'll shut up now and let others talk. Yeah, I think that like even though I didn't experience um, uh, really any explicit overt um, discrimination, I felt it. And but I didn't. I, I think um, I had a hard time understanding that that's what I was experiencing because it was so um, quiet. And so I think I'm seeing other other women maybe nodding here that. You know, you sort of, you, I, I spent a lot of time doubting myself and my own experiences um, until I started talking to other women and realizing, oh, we're all experiencing the same thing. And we're all going through the same, you know, um, the same experiences. And, and in the field, you know, I, I was fortunate to do field work with a lot of great guys who were very supportive, but there was also very much a macho culture, um, which 
um, I don't think I realized like how like damaging I had panic attacks when I did field work the first few times, um, remote field work. And the first time I went to do field work with a, a student of my, mine, who's a woman, was such an incredible experience for me because I realized that I could make this a good experience for her in a way that I had not had for myself. And that was very like rewarding and moving for me to be like, oh, I, now I'm in this role where I can then change the way things are done for the next generation. Yeah. So I'll, I'll jump in to say I had similar things on my list as well of our, our progress and uh, areas that I see are very inspirational as far as the status of, of women in paleontology. Uh, one, one experience to share for me is um, I, so when I was getting my undergraduate degree at San Francisco State, all the professors were men, and I was fortunate to have an internship experience at the U.S. Geological Survey in the Bay Area. And ironically, it was there that I met uh, my first uh, a female geologist, and they specialized in microfossils, so go figure, I suppose that was a big influence on me as far as, as specialty. And I thought, okay, now here we're in this deep macho environment that was very much the, the USGS in the 1980s, yet there were women fairly early in, in their career, but in these leadership roles. And so I'd watch them navigate and we weren't uh, as mindful, well, there certainly wasn't the vocabulary to describe everything I was seeing them go through, but it, it spanned the range from um, harassment, macro and microaggressions, the additional kind of care and thought and planning that they took when designing field work uh, to be certain that um, they were in a safe space. And just a, a side story to share about how much um, the, the area of doing field work safely um, came into play because I, I was fortunate again to have early field experiences while interning at the USGS. And so I was with a, a group, a field group that went to Alaska uh, on a field project. And the summer before, uh, we were all going out in the field. A, a geologist at USGS had been mauled by a bear and she was uh, working alone and that hadn't generally been the policy, but that was the situation for her. And so we all had to do all of this intense gun training and safety and things that you know should have been in place. But I often thought about just the isolation, you know, one can experience and the uh, extreme impact of that in the case of, you know, per personal safety. So it's like, not only do you have to put up with um, all of the human to human interactions in field spaces that are ripe for a lot of bad behavior, especially then, uh, but there's always that element of safety that you want to be careful about. So I thought a lot about these experiences just all through my professor years at San Francisco State, grateful for these early mentors, uh, female mentors in paleontology that definitely paved the way, uh, but the constant sort of caution and balancing and demands on time to do all the kinds of extra things that are often expected of, of women in science. Yeah, I think you make a really good point that all that is on top of doing your actual job, right? <laughs> it's additional labor that your male colleagues are not doing. And I heard that bear story when I went to Alaska the first time. It scared the crap out of me. <laughs> um, Irena or Carly, do you have anything to add? I just want to say that um, I guess I haven't been that long in the field just to observe uh, so many different changes. But I have observed a, a positive change into, uh, with respect to discussing and talking about these issues more openly and more frequently. And that is a really good start. Um, uh, however, I must say that um, based on the statistics, still the number of faculty members um, at the tenure level or, or full professor or, or positions that, you know, with um, uh, leadership positions, 
are not as common uh, for women as they are for men in, in geosciences in general. And, and there are several articles published recently that uh, show that. So still we are a long way to go, but I think there is a, an improvement and we are going moving in the right direction in my view. Yeah, I think I could add to what Irena said and, and others have said, I think right now women might be more likely to have peers in their undergrad program and PhD program, but potentially at the faculty level, not as much. My experience getting my PhD in 2015 is I didn't have a female faculty mentor until Linda Ivney during my postdoc. So my undergrad mentors, my REU mentors, my PhD mentors were all wonderful, but it wasn't until Linda that I had that first faculty mentor. Um, and I think what I've seen change a lot is technology, making it easier for people to connect and maybe find their community that maybe isn't at the university that they're at, but that they can make connections to peers and make connections to future faculty mentors, future PhD advisors um, through social media by following each other's accounts and then having those direct interactions. And I think that that just wasn't even available when I was searching for my next steps. So I think that's really a great way for people to connect and learn about one another before they move into those programs and to really be able to see what life looks like in those programs before they might get there. Yeah, and even to see, I mean, you're you're leading into our next question, which is about building community and perfectly. And, you know, just to see, oh, there's, you know, there's other people like me at this, you know, out there, even if I'm isolated at my one institution. I think that can be really critical, especially for, you know, people with minoritized identities. Um, and I think one thing that I, like I didn't, I had Alex Moore, who's on this call, was a wonderful undergrad mentor, not a paleontologist, but a wonderful mentor in geology. But I never had a formal woman mentor my entire career. Um, but I feel very fortunate that over the years I have developed a really wonderful sort of peer and near peer network of women who have really sustained me and supported me through you know the rougher patches of my career and that's something I didn't really have as a graduate student and so like it feels like there's you know we're moving towards this sort of critical mass where there is a community to connect with and to get support from and I think that that makes a huge difference yeah so the next question was basically about developing community or institution or with colleagues across the field so as, as Carly's pointed out especially in the last year you know virtual ways of connecting have been have been really important and there have been some really wonderful sort of affinity groups that have come up um, in, in the geosciences at, as, at large and as well as in paleontology so um, I'd love to hear other folks thoughts about the importance of community or what strategies or, or just serendipitous events led to you um, sort of building your community as a woman in this discipline. Yes, so I'm the only paleontologist at my institution. So except for two years when we had Chris Maples and Sarah Marcos with us, I mean, it was wonderful to know there were other paleontologists I could talk to. So I had to look outside the institution to develop that strong allyship um, along the way. So attending professional meetings was where I could do this, going to GSA every year, um, events by the Paleo Society and then AASP, the Paleontological Society, and getting very, very involved. I ended up being the president of AASP um, in 2012. That has really helped. But on my campus, because it's so small, the female faculty had to develop that sense of um, looking after each other. And um, so I did not feel alone just being female faculty. And um, so one of the things I did was to volunteer to serve on a faculty recruitment and retention committee that had to do something about campus climate. And for 30 years, we pushed to get a daycare or childcare facility. And finally, it's going to be a reality this fall. So that sense of community where I had to build both within and outside the university. And some of my greatest friends today were people I met at professional meetings who are paleontologists. I had a similar experience. Uh, what you said, Franca, really resonated with me. 
And you were one of the people that I met at professional meetings. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah, I felt very isolated because I, I was my the first half of my career was in schools of engineering um, in geology and geological engineering um, programs. And so I had no other paleontology colleagues, um, no women. You know, I was the first at Mississippi. Um, and, and so the way I built community was by meeting people at professional meetings, but also developing my own community of students. Um, I, was, I was really young when I got my PhD, I was 25. And so my students were about the same age as I was. And uh, so I, I naturally gravitated towards my students um, as my support group and we supported one another. Um, and I would say uh, also students were more willing to approach me with problems than, than some of the you know, old men who were, who were uh, a little more intimidating. I was much less intimidating. Um, and so, uh, so I think students gra uh, gravitated towards me also. And uh, even now, some of my, my closest friends are, are students. I've maintained good contacts with very many of my students. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, but it was hard. It was hard not having any other women, not having any other paleontologists around. And, you know, bless you students like Christy Visaggi um, so for, uh, you know, forming my community with me. Um, to me, um, uh, having um, good colleagues that you can count uh, on and, uh, you know, discuss uh, issues that may arise and, and, and you know, um, having um, people you can trust and give you advice in different stages in your career is super important for uh, success in academia, in my view. Uh, and that is not just from women to women, but from uh, women to men, men to women. So it's I I I feel very lucky to have had a really a good uh, support group of men and women, and um, I, I would say that, that the most uh, important part of the of the the journey is to find good uh, colleagues you can trust and you can uh, feel uh, supported. Uh, with and also finding good collaborators. That's another important component of the journey. Well, I was um, I'm sitting here thinking about the way my network has grown uh, by changing jobs. So when you're an education and outreach director and the ways that we share science and communicate it, about it and encourage others to really elevate uh, connections with the public uh, so that they better understand, you know, why paleontology is important. And having that as one of my primary roles uh, means I've inserted myself in a few communities uh, that I otherwise would not have networked with in an effort to just stay current. And we, we don't have a member of the vertebrate paleontology community on the panel uh, tonight, but I interact frequently with members of the Society for Vertebrate Paleontology, you know, given Berkeley's long history uh, in vertebrate paleontology and the nature of our collections. Uh, I interact with quite a number of, of men and women from, from that community. And so it's really, opened up um, additional ways, you know, I think about uh, the way that we, we do our work collectively as, as paleontologists and, and the image, you know, that most um, young people aspiring paleontologists have, it, it is often of a vertebrate paleontologist and not an invertebrate paleo person. So, I disappoint a lot of young kids too, you know, and they just assume, right? And I know the women on this panel can relate to that too. You know, you say you're a paleontologist and they assume that we study dinosaurs. So I do a lot of explaining too about what paleontology is, uh, but it's been great to expand the network and, and see, you know, what goes on in other subdisciplines of our field and really how traditional 
the vert paleo community was for decades in terms of you know who the leadership was even how it was founded you know through the bone wars of past centuries and uh seeing the struggles of of women in that community uh made me all, all the more grateful uh some days that i was a uh, part of a specialty where there had been more women you know as as part of the uh the discipline and and when, as many of the women on this panel know, because our work often um, does involve uh, marine systems, is you're connected to, you know, to other kinds of earth scientists. And for me, ocean scientists, I have sailed uh, multiple times as a shipboard scientist on the Joides Resolution Research Vessel and in my current role at the Museum of Paleontology. I have a number of projects uh, with uh, the Ocean Discovery Program to get uh, graduate students out to see undergrads, even teachers, so they get excited about research science as well. So, so you know, never know how you know your network can be utilized in ways that benefit um, the folks that that we're teaching and mentoring as well. Yeah, I feel like I'm super appreciative of my big network when my students tell me they want to go to grad school because <laughs> I'm like, okay, like <laughs> deploy the network. We'll figure out like where you should go and who the best advisors are. <laughs> it's really, it was great to hear about Trisha thinking about how your students become part of your network. So all my students are still here with me at San Jose State. I've only been here a few years and it's really exciting to think about in 10, 20 years when they're all out and established, um, how fun that will be to be catching up with them at future meetings and seeing what they're up to every year. Um, yeah, I think I, I think I mentioned before that I was just really lucky to be in this wonderful cohort of women paleontologists in grad school. And so that's been a really excellent support system for me. And just really, I think for me, knowing when you need to ask for help and making sure to reach out to people, especially right now with shelter in place, it can be you're isolated from your colleagues at work and you're isolated. You didn't get to go and debrief with everybody at a meeting. So I started some group chats, you know, to recreate the running into everyone in the hallway experience. And yeah, just making sure to kind of keep those connections alive when we're all sort of stuck at home for now has been really important. Yeah, I actually like FaceTimed my best friend from grad school who's she's a professor at Western Washington like twice today with questions about an article I'm writing, you know, it's just like, Robin, are you there? Pick up <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, just having those people who you feel like you can be vulnerable with with your science, you know, like, I really don't know what's happening here. And not that that has to be a woman because I have men that I can do that with, too. But um, I do feel like there's you know, real bonds that you make with your your cohort from graduate school that can carry you through um, into your career as well. Yeah. Anyone else have any comments about building community before we move on? I was interested um, what Irena said about finding really great collaborators, or if anyone wanted to kind of comment on how they've how they've made new connections with new collaborators. I know Franca, you mentioned meeting people at conferences in the past as well. Yeah, um, you really have to go out of your comfort zone to do that. And um, one of my most successful collaborations has been with three women, you know, where we are three PIs, all women, you know, on an NSF funded project. And that was really cool. Um, but some of my, I've had lots of male ment um, collaborators also, but it's through professional meetings, really. Um, there was one I had to go all the way to Spain, you know, for one of the uh, IPC meetings and an NSF grant came out of that, you know? So it's um, travel, I think is the key when you can do that again, but just being involved in those meetings. Yeah, same thing for me. I remember standing in a hallway outside a, um, a session at GSA waiting for the room to open up so I could go in, started talking to Tor Hansen, and we were both complaining that our latest NSF proposals had gotten turned down. And, and we started talking and we said, well, you know, you do all these, you know, little 
paleogene mollusks and I do drilling predation and I haven't looked at paleogene mollusks, you know, maybe we could get together. And uh, so we went out to lunch and we hatched a plan and, and uh, that led to like 20 years of collaboration. So yeah, meetings, very important. Yeah, for me, one of the greatest joys of my career, has, sorry, Yorna, has been um, like getting to choose who I work with in a way that, you know, isn't possible when you're a grad student because you kind of are working underneath, you know, in a different structure and just being like, oh, I can just work with people who are great, who I get along with, who I feel comfortable with, who are smart. And that's been such a wonderful experience for me. And some of that's just been serendipity. Like one of my close collaborators now, you know, like, just joined a field trip that another friend was leading and we connected on on research ideas. Um, but I think, you know, meetings can be hard, I think in some ways, and I, you know, travel is not always an option for everybody all the time, especially people with young kids and other responsibilities. So thinking about, um, you know, I know people who have written NSF proposals based on, on relationships that they built on Twitter that have been funded. <laughs> Yeah, the only uh, comment I was going to add is that um, um, it's uh, very important to find the right collaborators for you. Even there are many other people that might be a, a, a good fit on paper. Uh, at the end, we are people and personalities may collide. So, um, and you have to be okay with that. And just um, in order to succeed, I think you have to really learn how to uh, find the right people for you and, and stick with them. Um, yeah. Any other advice on finding good collaborators? Well, uh, uh, the only thing I was going to add is like, I guess when you're starting in your career, you don't have a, a name established yet. Uh, going to conferences and, and, and talking to people, especially at your same career, stage um, it's something uh, very important to build your community and uh, but in my case uh, after you build uh, a track record uh, I have established collaborations just by reaching out to people by email and just discussing a potential um, collaboration and, and that has worked as well so I think it varies as you advance in your career All right, our next question, um, which you know sort of builds off of the our very first one, but is, is more broad. Um, there have been a lot of new initiatives and programs that are working towards making our discipline and the earth sciences in general more just, equitable, diverse, and inclusive. What parts of these initiatives give you hope, and what areas do you think still need more attention and work? Well, I wasn't sure if I should start because I can go on and on and on, but I will keep it, it brief and I'm eager to hear from others. I, I did mention in the introduction that pretty much my, my whole career, I've been working on issues of diversity and inclusion and equity uh, in our science. And I haven't been working on these because I felt I had to, or I was forced to, but I think they're important and I've always, felt that way and and I, I love our discipline. I think there's so much opportunity um, in inner science in paleontology and and there was part of me that's just like, ah, I want us to compete with the other sciences for more diverse students. You know, they all run to the life sciences and want to be physicians or they want to be engineers. We have so many challenges in earth science at bringing in broader communities. And sometimes it starts with just the way that our discipline is, is perceived and um, how we market what we do or don't, you know, do that. But, but one of the things I wanted to say about the current climate is it's, it is exciting and it's inspiring to see that so many more people are invested uh, in making a difference. And there are initiatives, many of them funded, that uh, I think have brought 
folks to the table that never would have led um, an initiative on inclusiveness. So it's, it's great to see that. I can't say I feel less burdened because there's always a lot of expectation uh, for the, the geoscientists of color, but at least folks now, uh, we have their attention. It, it's a shame that it took uh, a tragedy, a series of them to wake more people up because uh, we've been sounding alarms for decades, uh, but it's awfully nice to not have to overly justify, you know, why, why this work is important. Uh, and then just an additional thing I'll add is, I'm also have seen shifts in the way that we are approaching um, how to address the problem. And it's multidimensional, you know, why we can't seem to ever change the numbers, but, but at least we can have more conversations about moving away from those deficit models that were so deeply entrenched in a lot of early diversity programs where we had to just briefly explain what that means for those oh, people who sure. might not know. Yeah. Yep. And so in a, in a deficit model, everyone, you're assuming that there's something wrong with individuals who don't know about geology or paleontology or that we have to fix what may have been wrong, you know, in their high school or where they grew up, you know, maybe they never had a geology or or class with that covered fossils and perhaps they are part of a family that never went to a national park or interacted with the outdoors and so those kinds of labels that oh th there are communities that didn't have the same experience as many of us that are professional geoscientists so there must have a deficit you know there must be something wrong with them so early programs were shaped on fixing the student you know, let's get them out engaged in outdoor experiences. Let's support the teaching of our science in high school. And, and, and hey, I, I've been leading some of those, I have been known to <laughs> direct some of those because it can be part of a model, but it can't be the sole way that we try to change the makeup of our discipline. We have to look inward. We have to look at the the climate of our departments. Uh, we have to really think about these longstanding practices and the sort of culture of geoscience. Some of that's connected to field work and all the inequities that uh, we see associated with that. Uh, so there's some of the movement away from trying to fix the students that we hope to draw to the discipline uh, has produced more opportunities for us as, as leaders uh, to uh, try to design programs that um, really challenge those of us in positions to make change, to do some of the structural changes in departments. Awesome, thank you, Lisa. I mean, and Lisa, like she said, just to emphasize, has been a leader in this field for decades. So really appreciate her um, sharing her, her, her insight with us. Thank you. I think in addition to um, departments, it's also the professional societies that are beginning to give me hope now. Um, it used to be that it was just the Association for Women Geoscientists that was the only group that paid any attention to, um, you know, gender disparities and, and that sort of thing. But now a lot of um, professional societies like the Paleontological Society, GSA, um, you know, they're, they're creeping along towards um, towards improving the situation. Um, a lot of societies have codes of conduct now, um, <clears throat> different, different diversity initiatives. So I think, I think that's, that's a hopeful thing. You know, a, a lot of progress still needs to be made, but at least people are moving in the, in the right direction. And um, as I said before, there's not so much overt um, issues of harassment and discrimination. There's still a lot of subtle things going on, um, but, but we are making progress and that does give me hope. I'll just yeah. be Debbie Downer for a second and say, yeah. oh, go ahead, Franca. Yeah, so I also do agree, you know, um, but one thing that we still have, to, that still needs some attention is for people to 
accept increasing diversity without attaching some stigma to it. I felt that when I started out 30 years ago and there were times somebody may say to me, you got your job because you were a black woman. And me being who I was, I mean, I would respond and say, hey, am I good at what I do? You know, and, you know, so it's, I mean, I would address it and maybe discuss it with them. And in the end, make them realize that I didn't get my job because I was a black woman, but I got the job because I was good at what I did. You know, so there's still that because I serve on a lot of um, search committees where that comes up all the time. Even when you go through sensitivity training, you still have such remarks being made. You know, so there's still some work that needs to be done there. And the other is pay equity. Pay equity. You know, women still get hired at lower pay scales everywhere. You know, so, and that's some, something that still needs some attention. And I think um, there's some, there's some work, you know, going on along that. Yeah, I really appreciate your perspective there. And I think that, you know, no one wants to be hired because of some aspect of their identity, right? You want to be valued for the work that you do. Um, no one wants to feel like a token. One thing that I've been continually frustrated with, I feel like it's getting incrementally better, is that oftentimes I'll go into webinars or, you know, DEI workshops, and it'll be 80, 90% women in, in a field that is, you know, not even 50% women <laughs> at this point. Um, and that's been a continual source of frustration for me is just feeling like many of my colleagues who are men don't prioritize this work. Um, and, uh, you know, I have a lot of privilege, but still it takes a lot of time and energy for me be, to be involved in this work. And that is time and energy that is not being spent writing a grant. Um, and so that's, a, that's a, a still a sore spot for me, even though I think I'm very energized and excited by a lot of the change um, and the programs that are taking place and the, and the change in thinking that, you know, that Lisa was talking about, which I think is really fundamental you know, getting away from this concept of the leaky pipeline, which is sort of this passive drip, right? It's not passive, right? There's systems in place that exclude people. Um, so yeah, I want more, more of my guy friends to show up to these things. That's, I guess, my punchline. I, I was gonna add uh, that um, I think a couple of years ago, there was a paper published in Nature Geoscience that uh, actually did a study on, on noticed that there was um, no, uh, let me see, let me see if I can find it. Uh, You're talking no, about Bernard Cooper doc? No progress on diversity in, yeah. in 40 years. Um, and, and that was actually quite alarming, even after NSF uh, promoted this new broader impacts and outreach component to all the grants. And, and what in this paper it was uh, shown was that really the number of hires uh, at the faculty level and beyond um, uh, among minorities was really, there was no change in 40 years, uh, which is kind of alarming. And, um, but uh, I think um, I like, uh, you know, uh, you find uh, more workshops and more uh, ways to educate uh, the community on these issues. And I think it's a good start uh, just having these conversations and, and uh, educating uh, the community and of course encouraging everybody to participate and not just the minorities or the women uh, which are the ones who are always there um, so yeah I still some some work to do and I'm not sure how to really encourage colleagues to really consider this more seriously I use guilt. That's my strategy. <laughs> right. And I beat up on the male graduate students uh, among me. It's like, no, you should be leading this. And and Phoebe, I'm I'm glad you raised the, you know, the uneven distribution we see of genders participating in this. And I suppose it shouldn't come as a continued surprise to us the heavy service load. 
um, any women in in science in our science field. But but yeah, it's like here we go again. You know, even with the infusion of of interest and energy uh, around equity and inclusion uh, in geoscience, but it's still largely women that are that are doing the work. Um, on a on a note related to the participation of of men and early careers and graduate students in particular, we're we're really seeing a program that started with a uh, a single graduate student at Berkeley who taught community college before he came to uh, do his PhD at Berkeley. Asked me often over the span of a year why we weren't doing more with the two year colleges. And I never had a good reason and I stalled. I don't know what I said. I was doing too many other things. Whatever it was, it wasn't convincing because before I knew it, I started making connections with uh, many of the community colleges in the Bay Area. He already knew some instructors from there, but he just built out his network. And one thing led to another. We received funding from the Paleo Society to build out what initially were lab um, visits to the Museum of Paleontology at Berkeley. So we'd set up a, a three hour lab using our specimens. We'd coordinate with the instructors so that it could be integrated in the course syllabus. And uh, he was able to get other graduate students involved in uh, leading the labs and facilitating. And when um, the pandemic shifted all of us to virtual learning, uh, we shifted the labs to that space as well. And so now we have more than a half dozen of these virtual labs. We make full use of specimens from the digital atlas of, of ancient life and uh, not only PRI, but other museum specimens. And so we have this great community around this new program that other graduate students are really excited about. And I, there were a few times where I really sat back and thought that the guys led this effort and I just need to figure out how to, you know, put that in a bottle and make sure, uh, <laughs> or I, I always, that, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that maybe part of it is that, you know, men encouraging other men to do this work as opposed to their, you know, their naggy female colleagues. Um, so, you know, the men out there who are doing this work, like making sure that they are sending out these emails and inviting their colleagues to these events and that that, you know, that can can potentially play a role too. Yeah. yeah. Um, I want to get to our last question, which is the fun question, so that we have time for Q&A. Um, and so the last question is just, what is, you know, one of your favorite things about being a paleontologist? Um, it can be about being a paleontologist, being a woman in paleontology, it doesn't matter. And um, yeah, what do you got? Well, I'll go first. Um, I would say that that has changed over the course of the years uh, in different stages. I have enjoyed different aspects of being a paleontologist. Uh, at first, I, I, I was very driven by um, curiosity and, you know, research questions and just uh, feeding that, that curiosity of mine. So just creating new knowledge was super exciting and, and fun. Going in, in the field, field work, traveling, meeting people, it was very exciting. But I would say that right now, the most rewarding part of my, uh, my job or uh, being a paleontologist is the work I do with the students because just uh, being uh, serving as a role model, impacting their lives in, in the way I can in a positive manner and encouraging them. And, and that is like the most satisfying part of my job right now, helping the, the younger generations. Yeah, I, I agree completely. Um, sharing the excitement of our field with, with others is really important. And, and I loved doing it when I was a teacher. Um, especially taking students who were not interested at all. They were there to fulfill a science requirement and, and getting them interested in, in the subject. And, and then I retired and, and there's been a deficit in my life. Um, being a Paleo Society Distinguished Lecturer has been good, but um, of course during the pandemic that came to a halt. So, uh, you know, my four-year-old 
grandson is the one who has absorbed all this enthusiasm now and he he looks at all my uh, prehistoric life class slides over and over again and he he could give my lectures for me <laughs> so you know all ages you know talking to all ages sharing the excitement of of our field i think that's one of the things i like best about paleontology yeah, for me, it's the thrill of deciphering about the, the past and what we can learn from the data that we generate from fossils. So we start out with an unknown fossil and then discover what it represents. But of course, you know, the opportunity to travel, I think has been one of my favorite parts of being a paleontologist and then traveling with students and imparting that knowledge to them. So th those are mostly mine. I have a, um, a four-year-old friend right now, like Trisha does, uh, my, my very good friend's four-year-old who I've been WhatsApp chatting with as he imagines digging up dinosaurs in his backyard. And I am consulting on the best techniques for excavation, preservation, and identification of Giganotosaurus. And I haven't, Lisa, I haven't broken it to him yet that this is not the kind of paleontologist that I am. I'm just letting it go. I'm just Wikipediaing these these pieces of information for him about these uh, new dinosaurs. So that's been, I think that's a really great part of being a paleontologist. But I was going to say the, the also the interdisciplinary nature of the work that we do, like the fact that we can have collaborators in the geosciences and in biology and in statistics and um there's just so many different ways to approach our problems that we have in our science that it just means that we get to work with so many different types of excellent researchers and i've really enjoyed that even though i'm just getting started here well i definitely agree with so much of what is said and and carly yes so hold out until the last possible minute with your little four-year-old friend and uh, perhaps i'll add that i've uh gained new appreciation for a museum communities and, and museum networks and just get so excited at the kinds of collaborations that I've tried to build with other museums that I see forming. And, and now, especially at a time when we're all putting more time and energy into digitizing our collections, uh, making them more easily shareable and, uh, not only with other researchers, but also with the public. Uh, it always just makes me feel really good about the times we live in and being a paleontologist and, and being able to, to share and promote, you know, 3D images and excite people about our science in the same way that scientists um, get excited about our work and our, our specimens. Yeah, I'll just say like a sort of a combination of what everyone else said. I think, you know, one of my favorite places to be in the whole world is on the scanning electron microscope with an unknown sample on, you know, the little stub and just kind of seeing a, you know, 800 million year old fossil for the first time. And I knowing that I'm the first human to ever lay eyes on this amazing object that was, you know, has such history to it and can tell us so much about the earth past that's still just even just describing it to you i'm getting the chills it's just it's just still a thrill for me um and then yeah and then teaching like there is nothing better than like i think um patricia was trisha was saying like you know a student who takes her class to fulfill a requirement and then ends up falling in love with it and um you know reading those end of semester evaluations or whatever having them come to your office afterwards and just seeing that sparkle in their eye and knowing that they've you know <laughs> they've caught the bug um and uh you know answering their questions and and getting to sort of share in their enthusiasm um so i think those two things are very different one is just me by myself in the basement and the other is you know the joy of of, of teaching and and learning with others which is i think really special um anyone have any last comments or things they want to add before we open it up to our little q a um thank you all so much so um John, I think this is where you come in. So we're gonna do this thing where um, you're gonna all get put into breakout rooms and have a couple of minutes to do what we in the teaching world like to call think, pair, share. 
um, where you come up with a question together. So it's like pre-vetting your questions. Um, and then we'll come back. And those of you who are remaining um, can ask some questions. So. Yeah, that uh, made my work easy. Um, so I'm just gonna click the button to send you off to uh, breakout rooms. We're gonna keep it short because it's already quarter to nine. So you'll just be there for five minutes till 8.49 or so. Um, and uh, uh, just as Phoebe said, craft your questions and um, we will see you back in five minutes. It'll take a moment for, um, for you all to filter off to your rooms. And there will be a clock that's wrong. So 8, 8.49, 8.50 is when we'll come back. I forgot to tell the other panelists that they can leave their room. Oh, yeah. So they don't have to stay in there forever. Right, right. Yeah. Um, oh, well. <laughs> Still working on it, huh? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I'm moving, I'm moving them out. OK. I moved you all out so you could have a little break because <laughs> we all got tossed into a breakout room, so. Yeah, and you know, this is the first panel that we've done, so it's a little different than. Past. Yeah, someone was already asking me a question, you know, so. Uh, yeah, I was talking to somebody, but I was like, okay. Oh, sorry. You know, it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> Communication breakdown. Well, hopefully everyone having a minute to just think, well. Yeah. Um, our Q and A a little bit more um, yeah. valuable. So I have with us here one of she's a freshman. Emma, can you unmute yourself? She's at my institution. Hi. She's a freshman who loves paleontology, and I invited her to this. Patrol me. Emma, Emma, yeah. So, just say hi to everybody. <laughs> Hi, it's nice to meet you. Hi, nice to meet you guys. Yeah, she's a freshman, but she loves paleo. And I hope you were inspired by what you were hearing. Yes, it was so cool hearing all of your guys' stories and all, all of your guys' insights and everything. It was so cool, yeah. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Franco, for sending this link out to me. I thought it was so cool to be able to join this. I'm glad you were able to join. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry for putting you on the spot, but <laughs> I was just too excited to see you. No, it's okay. Aww. It's okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. So you can turn off your video. Okay, that's good. <laughs> Have you been teaching remotely this semester, Franca? I'm actually doing face to face, but how most of the students don't show up. They would rather join by Zoom, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. but Emma is always in class. She's one of the few who show up in class every day. So, nice. Yeah. Yeah, I'm on sabbatical this semester. So I, I taught like a hybrid in the fall, which was just exhausting. So I got lucky. I don't have to, I don't know what to do with this semester and hopefully by the fall, things will be mostly back to normal. Well, that's the hope. I got my vaccine, so I'm, I'm good. Yeah, I got my first one, so. Yeah. Yeah. I, was, I was supposed to go on sabbatical already, but I guess I'm going to wait until yeah get better so I can actually travel and go. Oh, well, well, yeah, I, mean, I, I don't want to stay. Yeah, city. I didn't have a choice because I become department chair July 1st. Oh, oh. wow. Yeah, so it was either get, get a one semester sabbatical or wait three years. <laughs> well, I got my, the only sabbatical I ever had in my whole life was after I finished all my years of administration. It was so oh my wonderful. God, no, we have a really good sabbatical schedule, so I take advantage good, yeah. of it as much as no. possible. <laughs> well, I kept moving from one institution to another, and 
So I think that's part of the reason I retired at such a young yeah. age, because, you know, I loved my sabbatical and I just, you know, <laughs> you I loved it. teaching. I wanted to be free. I wanted to have yeah, a, all the fun parts, you know, yeah, yeah. So, and I'm, I still have students that I'm working with. I'm just not teaching. So it's just, you know, yeah, maybe when you become chair, if you need someone to write to, please call me. Thank you. I did it for two years and seven months. <laughs> Oh, that's how precise Personally, i have a very small like i have a small department and we're pretty functional so uh, but i'm sure there'll be stuff that comes up that i am not expecting so i have to do with engineers yeah i'm sorry oh, I, I, I <laughs> so that's, that's all i can say <laughs> are, we coming, are we coming back don they're they're heading back yeah the button has okay. gotcha Getting this a countdown clock. Yeah. So Don, how do you usually do this? Like people put questions in the chat or just unmute themselves? Who care? Usually just unmute your, themselves, but this was a bigger group. We haven't lost all of those people. We've lost all of them. <laughs> no, a lot of them are still We're in back that group. Right now. Yeah, okay. Okay, they're coming back. Okay. okay there Got we go. some. Here's the flood. <laughs> yeah. So um Welcome back, uh, and um, oh, we've got a, still got a pretty large group, but um, I'm hoping that we can hear a question uh, from each group who wants to share one anyway, and uh, I think we can just go room by room. The room number one was uh, Christ Christina Mariana Page uh, and uh, Thaisa. Um, apologies for probably mispronouncing that. Um, uh, is there a question from room one? Yeah, so we just kind of were going to ask um, if you guys had any advice for young aspiring paleontologists and like how to make those connections and kind of push through some of like the issues that we experience with male colleagues. Good question. How much time do we have? <laughs> not much, not enough. Uh, <laughs> if you want to take a quick poke at it. I mean, very briefly, I would just say, find a support network wherever, wherever, if that's within your institution or outside of your institution, you know, joining a professional society, joining a women in science group. Um, that's sort of like a good first step. Um, and uh, in terms of like dealing with, you know, male colleagues who might be, um, you know, do do or say inappropriate things, like figure out like what the, you know, the repercussion, like what, there's like a code of conduct on your campus or, or whatever it is, and like familiarize yourself with those pathways for reporting. And, um, and again, having allies and having a support network can be super important to um, just have people to talk to if when those situations do arise, um, which hopefully they won't, but, you know, anyone else? <laughs> If your advisor or someone can just introduce you to one person, then you know, tell that person, I want to meet people. And that person will help you broaden your network. Yeah, or applying for grants to attend meetings. Um, and you know, um, depending on where you are in your career stage, you know, different groups have different programs, um, mentoring programs for, for students at different levels. Paleo Society, GSA, GU, you know, so taking advantage of those existing mentoring programs that can help you plug into a bigger network. And I would add that um, and going to conferences, meeting people, trying to socialize a little bit, even outside the professional uh, environment, it's a good way to start making friends and then start talking about science and then finding the right people for you, uh, both in the personal level and professional level. So it's just a little bit of socializing. And sometimes it can be really hard and uncomfortable because you know you have to force yourself to introduce yourself, establish connections and so on. But um, uh, over time you get more used to uncomfortable with that. And uh, not just women, I would really uh, try to find really good male colleagues as well because they are part of the solution. And, and I feel very fortunate to have counted with many of them that have helped me navigate academia and the problems that you may encounter. 
Yeah, one of my mentors was a male colleague whom a lot of people hated, but one somehow we hit it off. And he was the one who drew me out of my shell. And you I, have to be, and you have to be okay that um, you might not get along with everybody. So just find the right people for you. And some women can be very difficult. <laughs> so that's a great lesson to learn. Just because someone shares a part of your identity does not mean that they are going to be a, your supporter. Um, let's, we probably won't get to all rooms. So I'll, I'll go to room two next and ask if, um, if anybody's got a really burning question to, uh, chime in on the chat and then we'll make sure we get to that one. Um, room two was Dave, Linda, Meg, and Nancy. Do I have a question? Dave, yeah, I get, well, I, we didn't have anything major in burning, but there was a really interesting and still troubling observation from Meg that, you know, we do a little comparative anatomy here of different disciplines. And uh, and in the veterinarian school, this vet school at Cornell, I guess, the, um, the incoming class is still like, you know, it's like 80% women now, and they still have big problems going up the hierarchy with respect to numbers of women. And, they're just, and Meg is saying that they're not nearly as plugged in as we are here. And I'm thinking like, wow, we're just, we're getting some pretty good traction here, but we haven't gotten that far yet. <laughs> so uh, yeah, it's disturbing to hear that. Yeah, I would have thought the veterinarian would be more um, more aware of some of these things, but maybe not. Okay, um, I guess that's more of an observation. It's just an observation. We didn't have we didn't have any question. We just chatted. Okay, uh, room three was Emma, Liz, and well, Emma and Liz, I think, because Phoebe was with us in the main room. So do I, uh, I had the same question, just like any advice that you guys would give, but you guys already answered that question. So thank you. And room four was Alex, Linnea, Roger, and Thomas. I'll Can I just add one room. more piece of advice that came up that I just occurred to me? It was like, don't be afraid to cold email people who you don't know. Mm -hmm. um, they might not write you by, back, but they might. And there's no harm in trying to reach out to folks who, you know, who seem interesting to you or might have an opportunity for you. So. Yeah, and if you tell them they're interesting, that, that helps get a response. <laughs> um, okay, uh, room four was Alex, uh, Linnea, Roger, and Thomas. So I'm gonna speak for room four and we discuss diversity. Roger is involved in a group that is male dominated. I work at PRI where there are plenty of women on the staff, but we are almost entirely white. And trying to expand that diversity is a real challenge. And so if anybody on this call has some ideas, throw them out there. Well, I think one thing is to, um, to have greater representation in whatever materials you are representing you, like in your teaching or in your museum exhibits or, or whatever. Um, people need to be able to envision themselves as a paleontologist. And so if you're showing only pictures of, you know, white, old white men or whatever, that's not going to help. Um, so I think finding a way to, to use examples um, from people who are traditionally groups that are traditionally underrepresented um, in, in whatever media you're using to communicate with people, I think that's a really important thing. Yeah, and I would add that uh, just learning through partnership. So I'm very fortunate to be collaborating with PRI on a number of, of projects. And one in particular is uh, producing virtual field experiences. Uh, so Don and I and our colleague Rob Ross uh, have um, really thought about different kinds of dissemination plans for these virtual field experiences. Uh, and I started also just connecting to all kinds of communities through these kinds of materials that we produce. And so, so maybe that won't directly lead to diversity in, in staff at PRI. I think it does show a commitment to um, really developing different kinds of networks and partnerships with uh, museums and groups that are more diverse and can 
uh, sort of open the door to uh, some ways of, of involving uh, folks that are different. Yeah, I'm just gonna plug uh, Urge, which is a, a group sort of like that I'm involved in. Some of you may be familiar with, I put the URL in there, but our last session, session five, all the materials are available, was about hiring and admissions. Um, so thinking about how you write a job ad, you know, how you develop a rubric for hiring and all of the, you know, the things that you can do along the, the path of admissions in the case of students or hiring in the case of staff that can um, create a more um, diverse pool of, of applicants. Um, so I encourage folks to go check out those resources too. And there's a million links on there to, you know, all of the research that has been done on this topic. So. There's a huge resource collection there. Um, room five is uh, Carolyn, Jeff, Grace, and Karen. Is there a question from that? Um, I guess you can oh, pass on our there. group. We mostly just kind of chatted about um, uh, schooling and how to get into like the field of paleo if you're looking for like undergrad schools and whatnot, but there's a lot of other rooms. So I think you can go on to the next one. Okay, uh, thanks. Um, in room six is John, Rob, Silver, and Ebony, and that's who it is. Hello, yes, sir. So for our group's question, we want to know how can we increase diversity in science? Good question. Anybody want to take that? It's a big one. Yes, <laughs> it sure is. <laughs> I think um, Lisa spoke really well to this a little bit earlier about some of the outreach that's been done and, and not using certain models that are maybe outdated, like these um, deficiency models, like not coming to a student saying, hey, I need to fill these gaps in your knowledge, but rather meeting students where they're at and saying, hey, what excites you about the geoscience? How can we get those opportunities for you and really helping connect students to resources is maybe a different way of looking at um, increasing diversity in science. And as Phoebe yeah. shared with the products that uh, some of the urge pods are producing, uh, as well as just a range of publications over this last year uh, have suggestions and strategies. And it's, it's not the approach of see what sticks, but there are a lot of uh, different models out there. And so I think one has to uh, think about what might work in the institution where they are or what the overall go or overall goal is and, and make a plan. But there's no get rich quick. There's no overnight solution. We collectively as a community have to work diligently on this all the time. Okay, how about room seven, which was Brendan, Christy and Kristen. Hi. Okay. Um, so I teach fifth and sixth grader science in Philadelphia, and uh, I am also part of a curriculum writing group uh, for STEAM um, with a racial literacy uh, lens. Um, and we started the group because uh, we noticed that there's a lot of resources out there for educators who are teaching the humanities, um, when it comes to like social justice and uh, equality and equity and diversion or diversity, um, but there's not as much out there that's explicit for the, the science fields. Um, and I guess in this work, like a lot of us have noticed that we're in different places. So we kind of like use this bridge analogy where it's like, all of us want to get to that place where our lessons are like steeped in like, this, not only the stories of like the predominant stories, but also like the stories that have been erased throughout history. Um, we also want to get to this place where like we're going beyond skills and like state testing and like really trying to reach students, not only to give them like a breadth of knowledge, but also to get them to see themselves in science, like, and to identify themselves as scientists, um, but also to understand how they can fit in the bigger picture of like, changing the world through science um, and making the world a better place for people of like all different backgrounds and walks of life. Um, so we all want to get to that place, 
but we're ha- but like we're like on the other side of the bridge. So like some of us are like thinking about building this bridge to this like idealized place. And then other people are like planning on building the bridge and other people have built the bridge, but haven't crossed it yet. And some people are crossing it. And then some people are getting to the other side when they're writing their units. And then they're like, so I've like energized my students to see where the flaws have been in ways that science has been traditionally taught and excluded people of color or people of various backgrounds or erased people's stories. Um, And now what do we want them to do with that knowledge instead of just being kind of like upset or like disappointed? Um, And so I think we're like at the point where like, we're, we're just like, so now, so then what, like, we've spent all this time in the American education system teaching kids skills. um, And the focus has been on that. And now it's like, (laughs) how do we get the shift to be away from skills and to like this civic duty, like knowledge kind of see having kids like see themselves as individuals in in the bigger picture. And when we get them there, what do we want them to do with that awareness? Anybody want to take that? Well, Kristen, there are a number of different kinds of resources that that we've posted in the chat from, you know, using characters from popular media to inspire students, um, to uh, thinking about the, you know, colonial and frankly, you know, racist history of STEM fields that uh, needs to often be addressed when we think about, you know, why students don't mm. succeed when you consider, you know, how many roadblocks there are. Um, and, and I posted our Understanding Science website uh, at the Museum of Paleontologists, a g- great way to share science um, in a way that's not always about the individual who's doing the science or leading the effort, but about the collective, you know, why we need this community of of thinkers and a diversity of people to really drive knowledge. Um, And yes, it's all challenging, but I think there's different kinds of resources you could use maybe to inspire. Yeah, I mean, your question had a, like a, a million different, you know, aspects to it. It's a really big problem. And I think one thing is thinking about like, you're sort of like, well, what do we want our students to do? I don't, I mean, I think thinking about solving problems, like solving, you know, problems in their community, right? And using their skills that they've learned and using this newfound um, you know, these, you know, new information about, you know, integrating social justice into the sciences and, okay, well, what are you going to do now? Like, how can you affect change? Um, I think is an empowering way to, um, to reframe it as opposed to like, wow, things are really crappy. And it's like, yes, but instead of just sitting with that saying, well, what can we do with what we have? Um, or what can I do to build skills in the future that will enable me to, to make change? Okay, and uh, room eight was uh, Colton and Jan, and I see Jan put a comment in um, the chat, but if you wanna raise a question, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Thanks everybody. Um, my question was about um, any of you panelists who've had all male mentors, and I know Patricia Kelly mentioned this specifically, how in that, I didn't, I had female mentors, and um, in my group, I, I, I mentioned to Colton that I think whether um, consciously or unconscious, consciously, I, I gravitated toward female mentors. So if you don't have that or didn't have that, how did you, I, I said, nevertheless, she persisted, and I meant Patricia, I meant you, and so how? If you could speak to that in a minute or less, I guess. <laughs> well, I think I think I was very naive. Um, I think I just was unaware of everything that was going on around me, and I just 
I persisted. Yeah, basically. Um, I, I was inspired by Carol Jones, who was the woman that uh, was reputed to have been the only other PhD before me in this area. And she happened to come back and, and visit. And she said to me, um, don't let the bastards get you down. And so I didn't. I didn't. Um, and I, I had people on my side. Steve Gould, I felt, protected me from the general ambiance of uh, you know, negativity about women in paleontology. That, that was, um, I, I felt his, his support. Although, um, you know, then we'd go to GSA after I graduated and, and you know, he'd hang out with his, his male colleagues and, and I never really socialized with him, but, but he did have, give that protection to me. But yeah, I think it was, you know, just being naive and, you know, not, not really realizing how bad the situation was and, and just driving forward. So. I yeah. also had no female mentors in graduate school or postdoc. And I feel like I was, this was not a healthy approach, but yeah, like I ran on bitterness and like, I'm not going to let them win, you know, like, which is not a very healthy way to be. Um, but that, and I did have, I was able to build a network of supportive men and women, both in my institution and outside of my institution, who, who sustained me, some of whom are in this room. Um, so again, finding those people who you can rely on, building those connections and, and, um, you know, and not let, you know, and again, like I said, some of those people were men and they are still important people in my life who, who got me through a lot of those tough times. Um, so yeah, community, community, community. Yeah, I'll just chime in here briefly. Um, one of my greatest supporters in grad school was Simon Conway Morris. He was the only one who gave me a pep talk before I defended my <laughs> dissertation. <laughs> and, um, I think that saw me through because two people had just failed before, like, before mine came up. And it was such a rough time in the department. And Simon said to me, I watched you all these years slaving away in the lab. This is your work. Go there and tell them you did it. If you don't know the answer, tell them you don't and they should tell you. And that just did it for me. And today he's still a great friend. And um, there were females also who saw, who helped me along the way. My advisor was female. Um, she did what she could, but most of the help I got was from the male mentors during my, my, my doctoral work. So just look for who can help you. I think that's the best thing. Well, I would, just, I would like to just add that uh, I also have had uh, male mentors my entire career only. Uh, but I was, um, you know, I was in general, I was lucky. I felt I have had a mostly positive experience and, and I felt always very support, supported. But I also found um, female colleagues, maybe at my career level, not necessarily mentors, um, that, was, that would compensate maybe for the lack of um, a female mentor. Great, um, and we've just got two more rooms, so I guess we'll get to everybody. So room 10 is Justin, Peg, and Robert. Is there a question from room 10? Uh, well, we were, talk we were just talking about how, how, so many, how you ladies mentioned that, you know, people are misunderstand and think that, you know, paleontology is just dinosaurs and, you know, I admit, I personally found that track when I was young because of Jurassic Park, and that's how it started for me. But um, so we talked about that, and that led to that question of, you know, um, between the subfields of paleontology, such as, you know, vertebrate paleontology and invertebrate paleontology and paleobiology, which one do you think maybe most, most women go into? Because I hear, from what I heard, I see that Everybody here is mostly into invertebrates, ammonites, and microfossils. Yeah, I think that probably has more to do with PRI than, than the field. I think one thing that's always fascinated me 
uh, is that there are a lot of women in micropaleontology. And I think that's because it was a lab-based discipline. Mm -hmm. And so it was more accessible to women. So I've, uh, that's always been really interesting to me to go back and read papers, you know, by women many, many decades in the past. So I think some of that is, is about what the actual work was like. Um, I'm sure there are numbers, you know, data from Society for Urban Paleontology, and I don't know if someone else wants to speak more to that, but I think some of it has to do with historical patterns um, and things like field work, yeah. Uh, a second question I did have in mind, if it's okay to ask, um, going back to building a network, um, between all the social medias, what would probably be the best, the best social media to create a network on? If one would talk the other, such as like say Facebook, Twitter, Insta or Instagram, or Zoom here. I would say it's Twitter. You know, even though Twitter is can be very brutal, <laughs> but um, it's still Twitter. Facebook, I think, is for mostly grandparents, and but there's still some groups, <laughs> you know, that exist on Facebook and that they are, they are thriving, but I think it's Twitter. That's my experience. I've joined some, I've joined some, some groups on Facebook and it does kind of feel, kind of feels better to, you know, network in a group. So rather than one, rather than one-on-one, -on -one, so that way multiple people are share, sharing their views on the subject, which I think, th I think that's a lot more fun than, you know, one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah, I mean, I think you, you've just answered your own question. Whatever you're most comfortable with mm -hmm. is the best route for you. And I don't think there is a right answer. It's just whatever you find the most helpful. I'm not a big social media person user at all. So you can do it the old fashioned way at conferences and text messaging. It was a wonderful panel. Thank you so very much. And a reminder too that uh, our um, uh, exhibit opens Friday, or I'm sorry, Saturday, both uh, in the museum and online. And I'll put that link in the chat one more time too. And uh, any closing words from the panel? Thank Just you thank so much to everyone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great.